Lucifer and Christ. Lucifer the bearer of light, Christ the bringer of love. We find an awareness of two opposing powers in the religions of various ethnic groups. We also recognize these forces in Christianity. Today we will address the question concerning these two opposing forces. There are, in fact, powers that can be characterized as neither absolutely good nor absolutely bad. A quote-unquote good power in some connection can be an evil power in other situations. We need to think only of the natural phenomenon of fire. We must be grateful for fire because of the endless ways in which it helps us. In nature and culture, a new epoch began with the discovery of fire. But fire can also be responsible for evil effects. <clears throat> Schiller has described this beautifully in his poem, The Lay of the Bell. Quote, what friend is like the might of fire, when man can watch and wield its ire? What air we shape our work, we owe still to that heaven-descended glow, when from their chain its wild wings go, where, excuse, when, where it sitteth wide and wild, sweeps from free nature's free-born child. End quote. On the one hand, fire is beneficial. On the other, it brings ruin. Anyone who looks more deeply into life will no longer judge anything as always good or always evil. In Christianity, the snake, or serpent, is described as the seducer of humanity and called Lucifer, with disgust. The view of the Luciferic principle has changed, of course, but Goethe was right in describing the world view of the average Christian as follows, quote, Nature and mind, to Christians we don't speak so. Thence, to burn atheists, we seek so. For such discourses, very dangerous be. Nature is sin, and mind is devil. Doubt they beget in shameless revel their hybrid in deformity. End quote. <clears throat> this was not a view of primitive Christianity. It entered Christianity only later. Even among the Christian mystics of the first centuries, the Gnostics, the serpent did not symbolize evil but rather the spiritual guidance of humanity. The quote-unquote wise one, the leader, was called the serpent. This described the one who led humanity to knowledge. The serpent is the symbol of Lucifer. In the changing Faust legend, we can follow the transformation of the way in which the Lucifer principle was understood. Faust was a figure from the Middle Ages, half charlatan, half black magician, who practiced all kinds of arts, but gradually came to represent a certain archetype to people in that era. The Faust legend is the opposite of the Luther legend. Luther is the man of God who, with Bible in hand, resists evil and throws an inkwell at the devil. Faust, on the other hand, at first sets the Bible aside and becomes a physician who seeks wisdom instead of mere revelations of faith. Faust is fetched by the devil and is destroyed. The greatness of Goethe is that he allows Faust to be redeemed. This is a complete transformation of how the Faust character has been understood in past centuries. Goethe cast the Luciferic principle in the form of Mephistopheles against Faust. Parenthesis, Mephis means liar, Toffel means ruiner. It is an Hebraic name taken from ancient teachings of magic. Parenthesis. Faust is the white magician in contrast to Mephistopheles, who represents the emergence of black magic. Goethe does not allow Faust to fall to Mephistopheles. The name Lucifer means the bearer of light, from lux meaning light and ferro meaning I bear in Latin. This cannot be a principle of evil. To truly understand this principle, we must imagine ourselves back in very ancient times. If we want to understand the principle of Lucifer, we must think of the divine and human principles as they were construed in the earliest times of Christianity. When human beings began to develop, other beings were lower, while others were higher. These higher beings were gods. They became gods only after a long period of development. They no longer needed to receive the same teachings that human beings need. We think of earthly existence as having been preceded by another planetary existence, during which the gods, who later became creative powers, evolved. The gods have developed ahead of us. In a sense, they have already graduated from the school we are now attending. At a certain stage, at the outset of their evolution, the gods were also human beings.
we must look at how the various stages of existence relate to one another, beginning with the mineral plant and animal realms. When we consider the mineral kingdom, we must ask how it actually arose. This inquiry leads us to a deep esoteric truth. Take the example of coal. It is stone today. Several million years ago in Earth's evolution, what we heat our stoves with today was still contained in a beautiful forest of ferns. Due to a geological catastrophe, the trees were covered and went through a process that transformed them gradually into coal. With coal we can confirm that lifeless matter arose from the living. There were constituents of the mineral kingdom for which this is not as easy to ascertain, for example diamonds and quartz crystals, but these two once were a part of a life-bearing being. If we go farther back in time, we find plants that were later petrified into these other minerals. All dead matter has come from a single life. If all life were one day to be petrified, the earth would become a rigid body. Our plants of today are entities that managed to preserve life from an earlier age, when life was universal. Part became petrified, but another part succeeded in maintaining life. The ancient forests of ferns became petrified. A new kingdom arose upon which new life then walked. At first there was an age when there was only life, then a new age came when a part became petrified, and alongside it a young plant kingdom arose. The mineral kingdom is not chaotic, but rather beautifully organized. There is a wisdom in it. The entire framework of the earth is construed with wisdom. The plant kingdom preserved life. But we can trace itself back to an even higher kingdom. We can think of all living things as having come forth from this higher kingdom. That is the kingdom of love. A, prob a primal being must have existed there, a being that sheltered love within it. From that being, the kingdom of life separated itself off. And from this kingdom of life, the kingdom of wisdom separated off. Besides this, a younger kingdom of love was split off from the original kingdom of love. The beings of this younger kingdom stand at the level of the animal and already express love for the first time. But there is something still higher. The divine stands above all these kingdoms. The other kingdoms have all been formed from the divine. Now you understand how, at the beginning of our planetary evolution, the human being and God faced each other just as the mineral and plant kingdoms of nature stood in relation to each other at the beginning. <clears throat> Earlier there was a plant kingdom that did not need a mineral kingdom. But the younger plant kingdom needs a mineral kingdom. So too at the beginning of Earth's evolution the gods needed humanity. Without human beings the gods could have as little flourished as the plants without minerals. Consider the animal and the plant kingdoms. There is a very specific relationship between the two. The animal exhales carbon dioxide and the plant exhales oxygen. They are dependent upon each other. The lower kingdom, the plants lovingly give back to the animal what it needs. The plant keeps the carbon dioxide for itself and gives back the oxygen. Thus we have an ongoing wonderful exchange between lower and higher kingdoms. Such an exchange also exists between the plant and the mineral kingdoms. The plant is constantly lifting the substances of the earth out of the mineral kingdom and thereby raising them into a life process. In this way a higher kingdom works on a lower kingdom. Likewise, at the beginning of earth evolution, the kingdom of the gods worked with the human kingdom. At first there was an interaction such as that between plant and mineral, between animal and plant. The interaction between gods and human beings first found expression in what we call love among human beings. When human beings first appeared on the earth, they embodied both sexes in one organism. This power of love, of relationships between people, is what the divine used to express itself at the beginning of earth evolution. The gods receive the love that pulses through human beings and live from it, just as animals live from the oxygen provided by plants. The love that lives in the human race is the nourishment of the gods. In the beginning everything was built on this love. Blood ties connected people. This is the basis of tribes, groups and ethnic groups. At the outset of human evolution all the power of the gods was based on this love that weaves between the sexes. Love existed before the two sexes came into existence as a completely conscious love. 
When human beings became either male or female, the consciousness of love was darkened. It became a blind drive, a sensuality that is not filled with transparent clarity, but rather is lived out as a dark force. The gods reigned above in the consciousness of love, but human beings below practiced love as a blind instinct. The gods were nourished by this blind instinct of human love. For them it became a bright light. A clairvoyance is possible that allows everything that lives in the human being as blind instinct to become perceptible. At the beginning of human evolution the gods had this vision, but human beings lacked this ability. They were filled with passions. They were flooded with what drives the two sexes together. The gods lived in the astral light. They saw these drives and lived from them. Earlier, a younger plant kingdom remained behind and pushed back the mineral kingdom. Likewise, a new realm of gods arose from an ancient realm of gods. Humanity, as presently constituted, then came into existence. There were also beings that had not developed full consciousness in the astral light. They stood between gods and human beings when humanity began its existence on the earth. These beings we call the hosts of Lucifer. Under the influence of the gods alone, who had attained their perfection during earlier evolution, the human being would have remained without the astral light, without knowledge. These gods were interested in nothing more than that the human being live on the earth. But Lucifer had to make up for development he had neglected earlier. He could do this only if he employed the human being for this purpose. The realm of the senses was a part of the human kingdom. Lucifer had no sensory existence. He had to use the bodies of human beings in order to advance himself. For this reason he had to give human beings the ability to see in the light what the gods had implanted in them. The gods implanted love in people. Lucifer had to seduce them into seeing it in the light. We have then the human being, the shaped form, wisdom. We also have Lucifer, who gives light to humankind, and finally God, who floods people with love. Lucifer has a much more intimate relationship to human beings than the gods that reign in love. Lucifer opened the eyes of human beings. When we open our eyes and look out into the world, Lucifer is within us, looking out into the world. He is completing his development in us. As long as we were carried in the womb of the gods, we were children of God. Inasmuch as we strive for wisdom, we are a friend of Lucifer. This is expressed in the legend of Paradise. Jehovah formed the human being. He is a spirit of form. He would have created human beings so that they live in love without light. Then Lucifer the snake came and brought us the light of knowledge and thereby also the possibility of doing evil. Thereupon Jehovah said to the human being that love that is united with the knowledge of Lucifer will bring pain. Jehovah curbed the actions of the one who implanted love, who brought light to love by adding pain to love. Cain presents us with the example of one who rebelled against what is created by love bound to the blood. He cut through the blood ties. However, he also represented independence. Alongside passive love is the active, light-filled work of knowledge. Love is a gift from Jehovah, knowledge a gift from Lucifer. Love must be ordered. The organization of familial bonds is derived from the law given on Mount Sinai. Outside it stands knowledge. The origin of the light that should shine from human beings themselves is the light-bearer within them. This too must be deepened. It must experience a new phase. This cannot happen if the law alone holds sway from outside of human beings. The law works through external compulsion. What Christ brought to the earth works from inside. It is the light that has been elevated to love, the law that is born in the soul itself. Paul called it grace, the law that was given from the inside of nature, that is both light and love, and that began a new evolution on earth. Paul called Christ the new Adam. The God of love worked above human beings. Within them, Lucifer, the light, worked. To reach love, one must first become light. Through the appearance of Christ Jesus, this light has been transformed into love, Christ Jesus represents the elevation of light to love. In earlier times, people spoke of Lucifer as the opposite pole that brought light to humanity. Two powers must work on the earth, the bearer of love 
and the bearer of light. Light and love are two poles for humanity. We now, we now live subject to the influences of these two forces that appear as a polarity. The gods who give the impulse for love were once light, and light is now called upon to become love. Light can be misused and lead to evil, but it must exist if we are to become free. The first Christians saw in Lucifer a force that should work in human nature. This attitude was changed only at a later date. Only someone who has passed through the torture of doubt can be fortified in knowledge. Early Christian humanity still had to be protected from the light, but the time has come today when the bond between love and wisdom must once again be created. It is created when knowledge as wisdom is born in human hearts through love. This knowledge which is to be born in human hearts through elevation to love is spiritual science. In ancient times we had the law. Through Christ the law has become grace, as the law has been lifted out of the human being's own heart. Now knowledge can be lifted up again to love. Inward Christianity should be added to the external organization of Christianity. <clears throat> Until now Christianity has been able to realize love only in its institutions. But we must carry love in the greatest depths of the human breast. Today all people still love their own opinions. Love stands above opinions only when people can get along despite the most diverse beliefs. The greatest variety of convictions could exist alongside one another with love above all. Then individual opinions do not work alone, but rather all of them together work in a great fire.